Comes and goes, bit of blue sky, bit of gray sky, bit of this, bit of that, but no snow, no sleet, no hail today, as we heard someone had uh, this weekend already for a wedding. That must have been fun, but uh, welcome to West Shore Community Church. A very happy Easter to you on this uh, April 17th. It was just, I don't know if you heard it a bit ago, maybe walking in, but I could hear Church of the Advent's bell ringing. And probably going for about five minutes, like, oh, we got to respond. So that's, that's why I had to get this bell going, because the church that's there used to be the church that was here many years ago. So um, I, but I, they left the bell. And, and then I think someone said, you know, this is a better bell. It's, it's, it's got a little more oomph to it. So uh, not that it's a competition. <laughs> but uh, I like this hundred and some odd year old bell. It's a beautiful thing to hear. And on Easter morning, what better day to you know, let the neighborhood know, let the world know that He is risen. He is risen indeed. You're almost there. He is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. That is the calling of the church. Uh, whether we are Orthodox or whether we are Pentecostal or whether we are uh, Anglican or Catholic or Baptist or whatever strain, flavor, or whatever you might want to call it of church, we all have this same creed that we serve a risen Savior. Because if we didn't, there'd be no point to any of this. There'd be no point to life. In fact, I don't think there would be life. So here we are because he is risen indeed. And uh, this morning, I think it's just going to be a time of celebration of that fact. Today and every day that we gather, um, every day that we have, is a celebration of the life we have in Christ. Amen? Amen? Just a short video to kind of get us sort of thinking about things, and uh, then we're going to get into some music. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of Lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. 
He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Amen. It's um, an old, old book in the Bible. In fact, it's probably the oldest book in the Bible. The book of, anyone know? Job. Exactly. And that's our call to worship this morning. Would you stand with me and read these words that were written just a couple of thousand years before Christ came. This is what Job came to understand. Let's read this together. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last He will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Coming out of the worst situation where everything seemed to have fallen apart, where all hope seemed to be gone, Job said, despite all this, I know my Redeemer lives. And no matter what happens to this old body, one day I will see God and I'll see him face to face. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that is us this morning.
Romans 5.1. Let's read this together. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's that picture of that coming into the Holy of Holies, of the curtain of the temple being torn in two. We have access to God. It used to be that the priests could only do it. It used to be you had to get someone else to go to God for you. Well, guess what? We don't have to do that anymore. And it's been 2,000 years of having free access to the Father because of what Christ did at the cross. And that is our great hope.
Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. May that indeed be our cry today. And you are such an awesome and great Savior. There is none other but you. And we come and we gather in this place today as your children, as your people, and we say, God, we need you. We need your, sa your saving. We need salvation. We need Jesus. And so, God, we honor you. We bless you. And we praise you today for displaying such incredible love through the giving of your Son. And that, Jesus, you would give your life willingly and lay it down for us and pay for our sin that we committed against you, every single one of us. And, God, you said, I will take it and I will pay for it so that you can have life everlasting if only you'll come to me and lay it all down at the foot of the cross. And so, Lord, we do that today. And we humbly say thank you for this love. Thank you for this grace in which we stand, the forgiveness that you offer to everyone. So that anyone who calls in the name of Jesus will be saved and will have that life everlasting. God, we bless you and we honor you and we bless you alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this 
is solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter. of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. stand for a thousand years? Oh, I can't wait for the new knees to come, right? Yeah. Yeah, new knees, new legs, new back. Yeah, and we get to just praise God and stand in his presence and give him glory forever and ever and ever. And this whole thing won't get worn out because we, we get a new thing. Scripture tells us we will have one like his, a body like his. And Jesus had a pretty cool body after he was resurrected. You know, he could walk through walls and peer in doors, be in one city, then another, uh, he could eat broiled fish, that we know. He had skin and bones, and yet he was able to do all this stuff. And it says, we will be like him. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And so there's something to look forward to, that we'll be able to stand with him forever and ever and ever. Uh, let's just give everyone a wonderful little wave. We won't do the whole handshake and hug thing yet, but uh, greet each other this morning. Wish each other a happy Easter. <laughs> And you may make yourselves comfortable. <laughs> we had a beautiful time down at the beach this morning and watched the sun rise and uh, got to be, you know, witness to, 
you know, a bit of a later sunrise. There's a bit of a bank of clouds there that, you know, made the, the actual rise over the horizon take a little longer than maybe expected. But it was beautiful just to be there and start the day together worshiping the Lord and letting the neighborhood know that he is risen. Got some good orthodox in us. I can feel it. And uh, it was just wonderful to praise God together. And I think that is something that the church is called to do, to go and be proclaimers. Uh, we aren't called just to stay in a, a little building like this and uh, keep it all here and keep it all to ourselves. Uh, knowing the truth and that fact that the truth has set us free, sets us free to go and tell people about Christ and let the Holy Spirit do the work of working on hearts because that's what God does. And he's been doing that for a long time. And uh, we've been told to go and do it for a long time. In fact, that was one of the first things the angels said when Jesus was risen. The women came, and later a couple of disciples came, and they, say, and they just kept saying, go, go and tell, go and tell. That's why I think we sing it, you know, Christmas time, we say, go tell it on the mountain. Jesus Christ was born. But now that he's been born, we don't celebrate that birthday all the time because, yeah, that's cool that he came. But the really cool thing is that he died and he rose again. This is why he was born. And so we not need to go tell it on the mountain that Jesus is alive and Jesus is coming back. And this is the exciting thing about the Easter message, about the gospel, about the Bible, about the truth that lies within it, is that it's full of hope and all the things that this world needs in times where things seem so hopeless. I don't know about you, but over the last, I guess it's about eight weeks now, since we've been watching things happen in Ukraine and seeing people suffer and have their cities and homes destroyed and wonder, how could this happen? How could one nation come up against another and simply desire to wipe things out and wipe people out? We don't understand. Why people have to flee by the millions to nations around them and even to our nation. We have people right here who have fled from the Ukraine to come and find hope and life here. We've been dealing with this pandemic for two years. And hundreds of thousands have died because of it. Millions have been infected. Many millions upon millions have been sick and been laying in hospitals. And we've been suffering. We've been separated. And we haven't been able to gather for two years trying to, to keep each other safe and trying to be healthy and, and look after one another. And it's been hard. Why does this kind of suffering have to happen? We see people getting hurt. We see babies being hurt. We, we hear of terrible things in the news of what people will do one to the other. We see relationships falling apart. We see communities falling apart, workplaces falling apart, economies falling apart. It would seem like everything is falling apart. What a wonderful, encouraging message for Easter. <laughs> but this is what we hear. But the truth is, there is always hope and there is always assurance. And Christ is always with us. He said, I will never leave or forsake you. I'm with you to the very end of the age. I'm with you through all this stuff that the world's gonna throw at you just have faith. And the Easter message, the Easter story, the fact that Christ did rise from the grave, that he was just borrowing the grave. Brand new tomb. No one had ever used it before. He only used it for a couple of nights. You know, and so, you know, it's, it's still fresh and clean. I saw a cartoon this morning from a pastor friend of mine who was preaching. He, he had a picture of, you know, a for rent sign in front of the tomb. That's basically what Jesus did. He took it and then, yeah, gone. Joseph could, you know, rent it out again. But, total aside. <laughs> he is not here, he is risen. We visited the place in Jerusalem where at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre they have this monument over the place that is believed to be the spot where Jesus was crucified and buried and rose again. And it's, it's an amazing looking place. I believe there are at least five different churches within that complex of churches and they all get their time over this weekend to come and have their moment to have their worship services and praise and prayer and do all these rituals around this spot. But the thing is, it's just a spot. It's a hole in the ground. It's a rock. It doesn't mean anything. It's the fact that it is empty and the one who borrowed it for a couple of nights and for three days was, was dead. He's risen. He's risen indeed. And we get to celebrate our risen Savior. And that we can do anywhere. You don't have to go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. 
You don't have to go to St. John the Baptist Heritage Church. You don't have to go to some grand cathedral. You can be anywhere and worship the risen Christ. And that is what we're going to celebrate today as we look into the word and recall what happened on that morning. I've asked Deb to come and read scripture for us today uh, from Luke chapter 24 and uh, to come and just share with us a little bit about what happened that morning. Deb. So Luke 24 verses 1 to 12. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they, and certain other women with them, came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. I wonder, I wonder how long that Sabbath day, after all these people had seen the day before, felt. These women who awaited the first day of the week, how slowly did the sun, which God had reignited at this point, because remember he turned it off for three hours while Jesus hung on the cross. I wonder how slow it seemed to move across the sky that Sabbath day. You ever feel like time's going so slow and something can't come soon enough? As sunrise approached, the women had to deal with some emotions. I'm sure there was grief, probably some fear, confusion. Their, their emotional scale must have been at 10 plus after all they'd witnessed. But why were they going to the tomb anyway? Why, why head to a tomb? Was it to have it out with those Roman guards who were watching over the tomb at the high priest's request? Give them a piece of their mind? You Romans, you killed Jesus. You killed our Lord. Maybe they just wanted to give it to him. Maybe they went there to see if what they had witnessed just a couple of days before had really happened. Was it all just a, a dream or did we actually witness this gruesome execution of Jesus? Did we really see all of that? Maybe just to confirm in their minds. Perhaps they went in order to see Jesus rise from the grave. Maybe their faith was so great that they were just ready to be there at the crack of dawn and see him come up. Nope. It was none of those things. They went to further prepare Jesus' body with the spices they had prepared a couple of days before. That was the Jewish custom in burial, to wrap the body in spices, have it all protected so that it would lay in that tomb for a year as the body decomposed and they waited for the bones to be left, which they would then rebury about a year later. And they were going to prepare all this. Their master was dead. And surely Jesus deserved a proper burial, not just a hurried one. Everything had been so rushed after Jesus had been taken down from the cross and laid in the tomb because the Sabbath day had come upon them. They didn't have time to do things right. 
Joseph of Arimathea had asked Pilate for the body and quickly placed it, just wrapped in a simple shroud, in that brand new tomb cut out of stone. So they walked to the tomb to do all this. And they were suddenly a little perplexed because things weren't what they expected. I don't know if any of you have loved ones buried and there might be a tombstone placed upon the spot of where they're buried and you've been to the funeral and everything's just so and you go back to visit expecting things to look just as they did. Maybe now the grass is growing, the flowers have wilted, they need replacing. You come just to visit. But can you imagine having a funeral on Friday and showing up Sunday morning to the graveside to see that everything's dug up, the stone is rolled away, and there's nobody there. Yeah, you'd be a bit perplexed. What's going on? They see the stone of the tomb rolled away. And this is but a simple image of a stone rolled away. This is a, a picture uh, from, from Israel of a, a simple sample of what a tomb may have looked like, cut out of rock with a stone ready to roll in front of it. And it had been rolled in front of it. On Friday, a guard of a hundred soldiers had been placed in front of it on Friday. But this creepy thing is happening. You go up to the tomb and the stone's gone and so is the body that's supposed to be in there. A little weird, a little strange. I think any of us would be just a little perplexed. I think that's probably a gentle word they translated when they brought that out. Freaked out, wondering what's going on, confused, dazed. This shouldn't be. But wait, there's more. While the group of women are trying to compute in their brain why they're standing at an open tomb with a bunch of Roman guards, about a hundred of them, just lying on the ground everywhere, looking like they're dead. You read that in Matthew 27, by the way. There's been a violent earthquake that morning. The whole place has been shaken up. This is the scene they come upon. And while all this is happening, while they're trying to figure it all out, suddenly there's more. Now there's another sight in front of them. Two men. They look like men, but they are angels. Are standing with them all of a sudden. You know, I can see this group of women. They're all just kind of staring at the tomb, looking in. And suddenly there's two guys standing beside them. And they are described as being in dazzling apparel. Matthew describes it as if they were dressed in lightning. Now, try and put that in your picture. Like, the author is trying to say, you know, these guys were bright. Staring at the sun this morning as it came up, you know, you can only look for a couple of seconds and the sun was pretty intense. We're not supposed to stare at the sun very long. A flash of lightning is brilliant. Stare into the, the flash of your, your cell phone and have that in front of your eyes and maybe get a little glimpse of what it's like to stare at lightning. These are guys in lightning clothes, and they're standing with them in the dim light of early dawn, lightning men. God, this is just too cool. <laughs> we have to try and picture this in our minds, that this is what they came, they came to wrap up a body, and this is the scene they come upon. Their graveside visit, which they were doing just to alleviate their hopelessness, is met with all of this activity. I thought graveyards were supposed to be quiet places. I'd like that some days, though. How about you? Why can't we have some lightning guys show up to, to bring us some good news? The middle of the service one day, or maybe while you're walking down the street, or shopping in Costco, or, or filling up the car, and suddenly, lightning guys. <laughs> and they've got good news, because that's what angels do. They bring news. Why doesn't God answer our prayers like that? Why doesn't there, 
you know, lights flashing and earthquakes happening and the place being shaken up and all this going on every time we pray and we ask God for something. This is what the women got to experience. Oh, me of little faith. Why does anyone need further proof of God? Would that really do it if God showed up and, and was there you know, in some kind of presence? Wouldn't that be enough to, to make a person for the rest of their life worship and fall down to their knees and honor God with every breath they had? No. No, it wouldn't. You see, God did that. He did that for Israel for 40 years. He led them through the wilderness as a cloud before them during the day and a pillar of fire at night for 40 years. And that people followed, fell away from God immediately after they got into the promised land. Back and forth and back. They follow God, they fall away from God. They follow God, they fall away from God. Just like today, people follow God, they fall away from God. When things are good, they follow. When things go bad, they fall away. Because we have little faith. Why do we need more than everything God has already done through creation? Through His Word? Through the, the witness of people's lives being changed all over the place. The fact that we have life in the first place. Why is that not enough? Why are we always looking for lightning men and earthquakes and signs and wonders? We need faith. Why can't we just believe, trust, and surrender our will to the Lord's will and say, God, you've, you've done enough. I surrender. It's so obvious. And I need to follow you. Could it be that we just forget to do so? Are we forgetful people? We look elsewhere for the truth? Take, for example, the question posed to the women by the angels. Why do you seek the living among the dead? What are you doing staring into a tomb looking for someone who's alive? And they're probably scratching their heads going, um, no, we're at a grave because this is where dead people are. We came because Jesus is dead, and so we came here to pay our respects to his body and do all the things we're supposed to do. But why do people look for life, for purpose, for joy and happiness, for meaning in anyone else or anything else but Jesus? Why does anyone try to find the answers to eternity through people? who've only maybe had a few decades of experience with life instead of the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is from everlasting to everlasting. Why don't we go to God? Why go to a guru when we can go to God? Why go to some social media socialite when we've got God's word to refer to? Why go to someone who seems to have it all together? Why, why try and emulate them when just a few months, weeks, years later, suddenly they fall apart? Because that's what people do. When we put our faith in people, we'll find that we always get let down. When we put our faith in Christ, He's always faithful, consistent, never changing, unending, and forever true. That's where I want to put my faith. in something that's real, that's been around for a little while, like a few millennia, like forever. Everything this world has to offer always and only ever leads to one thing, death. Everything in Christ leads to life because he is the way, the truth, and the life and the only way to the Father. Other religions will say that Jesus is just a good, a good prophet, a good teacher. He's just one of many. Well, no, because no one else said what Jesus said. He claimed to be the only way, the only way to the Father, not a way, not one of several, not part of. No, I am the way, the truth, the life. Jesus said that. And if we don't accept that, if we don't believe that, then everything else is moot. But if that is the truth, then that means he's everything. And that means he is the answer to all my questions. He is the hope in all my distress. He is everything that I would ever need and nothing more. The world only offers temporary pleasures, distractions from reality, misguided counsel, and limited understanding. We have a little bitty perspective of, of what life is. 
I don't care how much science you go through. I love, and I've said this before, I love science. Science is cool. And a lot of the stuff we appreciate and do these days is because of science. You know, recording what I'm saying and putting it onto a little tiny card with no moving parts and be able to take that and post that on this thing called the internet so that anyone in the world can watch it, that's pretty wild. That's been done through science. But who created all of the processes that allow that to work, things like electricity and the way protons and neutrons and electrons all move around and are formed, who created all the raw materials that we build this stuff with, who gave man the, the brain and the understanding to figure all this stuff out so we can piece this together, assemble it somewhere, put it together, sell it for a monthly plan of 50 bucks, and say, here you go, go surf the net. God gave us all that. Without God, we can do nothing. But with God, all things are possible, even cool things like science which allows us to understand and figure out what he's created. Jesus is life, the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only one who conquered the grave, who conquered death, who, who holds the keys of, of justice in his hands and is one day returning. He's coming back because he said so. Or have we forgotten that too? only took a matter of days and a little bit of stress and worry over one man's life for all of Jesus' followers to forget that he said he was going to rise again. There wasn't one of them waiting on the third day to see him rise. Not one. Why not? Why is the church today not willing to, to go out and tell every single person they know about the truth of God? I think it's because we're forgetful people. We forget like these women did, like the disciples did, like every man, woman, child that followed Jesus forgot to do that morning. He told them over and over again. And the angels had to remind them, didn't he tell you these things had to happen? And they're like, oh yeah, right. Maybe we need to do a couple of these every now and then. Oh yeah, right, Jesus is alive. I do have hope. I don't have to worry, fret, and despair. I got to go through stuff. Yes, but I do so with Jesus at my side. I do so with hope. I do so with faith. So that no matter what happens around me, I'm good because God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Amen. This is what the angels told the women as they stared into that empty grave. He told you. The Son of Man had to suffer at the hands of evil men and on the third day rise again. Why weren't you here a little earlier? That would have been cool. But when I think about it, it must have kind of hurt God's heart a little bit that no one was there to see Jesus rise. Because all of the soldiers who were there, they, they were there, but they'd been knocked flat on their backs by the, the earthquake and the appearance of God's power. And even they didn't see Jesus walk out. They went and told stories about it afterward, but they just told lies because they were afraid for their lives because if a Roman soldier falls asleep on the job, well, that's a death sentence. So they didn't want to tell anybody that happened. The people then let rituals and burial rites get in the way of the words of life from the bread of life. And that can happen to any of us. We can all get caught up in the way we do things. So much so that we miss the reason behind why we do them. Like all the things we are used to doing around the holidays. Do we simply do them out of habit or do we recall why we do them? Why do we celebrate Christmas? Why do we celebrate Easter? Why do we celebrate all these days? Why did God give all these feasts in the Old Testament? Because he wanted to have people not forget about him and his goodness and his faithfulness and all the things he's done for us. And so we have these celebrations to remember we have this long weekend called Easter here in Canada because God Almighty sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who is God, to teach us about the kingdom of God, to create a new covenant between God and humanity through His sacrificial death on a brutal cross so that through the shedding of His perfect and sinless blood, our sin, your sin, my sin, could be forgiven, would be forgiven, with a simple act of faith. He died, 
and he was buried, and he rose again. He is risen. Don't forget that. Don't ever forget that. Don't forget as you face difficulties of all kinds in life. Don't forget that as you struggle through life's problems, and life is still full of them. Coming to Jesus and coming to faith doesn't mean your problems go away. It just means you now have someone with you through them, and you can have hope in spite of them. Don't forget that as the world around us seems to fall apart and evil seems to be gaining ground, that God has already conquered all of it. That Satan is a defeated foe. And that heaven awaits all of those who put their faith in Christ. Don't forget all that Jesus has said. And the only way to really know that is to get into the Word and to read it and understand it. That he said he's coming back. You might not get Easter dinner tonight. He might come back before then. Or maybe all those hams and turkeys and all that food sitting at home somewhere, you know, maybe that just becomes all part of the great banquet table of the Lord. I don't know how he's going to do it. And I don't know when he's going to do it. But I'm ready. Is your heart ready? Is your family's heart ready? Have they heard the news? Do your neighbors know what it means to know Jesus? Do your coworkers realize the kind of hope you have in spite of anything that might be happening on the job? Do strangers see something a little different in the way you carry yourself around the neighborhood, the way you react to the news of the world, the way you interact on social media? Is there a difference? Is there a difference in the way we live? The one part that Deb read for us in in Luke's Gospel kind of ticks me off. I don't know what you think about it. But those women, that big group of women, were given three names, but it also says, and all the other women. See, they all went to the tomb. And those stiff-necked men all stayed behind, hiding for themselves. It kind of ticks me off that Jesus' disciples cast off the women's story so idly by. Saying, ah, just an old wives' tale. These guys were the ones closest to Christ, and they should have known. In fact, they all should have known. They all should have heard the report of the women and praised God and, and just been waiting, okay, so now let's go find him. He's, he's around here somewhere. They should have been there at the tomb, not to adorn his body, but to anticipate his resurrection. But no, they were locked up for fear of their own necks, wondering whether they were going to be the next ones on the cross. Rather than believing the women's testimony of what they saw, what they heard, what they witnessed, they cast it off, save for a couple of them. Peter and John got up, and at least they ran to the tomb to see, well, maybe they're telling the truth. But they still stayed in a state of confusion. Peter went home scratching his head. Went to see his wife and his mother-in-law that Jesus had healed. And I just heard and seen the strangest things. But I don't really know what's going on. Oh, Peter, you should have known. And so that kind of upsets me. And I'm, I'm sure it kind of broke God's heart a little bit too when we don't have faith in everything he says. But when we hear people testifying about Christ, we need to believe what they say and not doubt it because that is their experience. That is what they've witnessed and seen and, and seen change in their life. When we hear that a person has come to faith in Jesus and had their life turned around and their hope restored their purpose of living revitalized, maybe, maybe a miracle even. Maybe a miracle of healing or perhaps just that, that amazing miracle of forgiveness. We need to believe what they have to say. How many times have you heard the testimony of someone and simply disregarded what they have to say and not taken it as truth? Perhaps it's time you checked out all these life-changing events and seen for yourself and looked for yourself and looked into your own heart and said, God, what's going on? Maybe your heart feels like a, like a tomb. 
Maybe you need the stone rolled away. Maybe you need to take a step of faith and say, God, I, I do believe this. Help me to understand it. Help me to live it. God, come in and clean house. I feel like I'm just full of empty bones. We do so by getting into the Word, getting connected to a group of people who are on the same journey, trying to understand what it means to know Jesus and make Him known. And it's okay to ask questions. It is okay to have doubts. Thomas did. He said, not until I stick my finger in the nail holes and my hand up Jesus' side. I I can't believe. He got that opportunity some eight days later. But he just fell to his knees when he saw Jesus and said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, you know, you've seen and believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and believed. That's us. We weren't able to be there that day. But you're here on this day. We weren't able to walk with Jesus through the streets of Israel, but we can walk with each other and walk through life together, knowing that he's with us and his Holy Spirit guides us through the truth. Maybe one day we too will marvel at the amazing gospel, the good news of Jesus. Maybe one day you'll be one to share your story with someone and bring them to faith, to have hope, forgiveness, and the joy of knowing a Savior. We have one who's ready to share his story today and give us a little bit of an understanding of what it means to know the Savior. We have one person who has come today to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that's Raphael. And uh, he's prepared a little something for us to share, and... um, I'm going to invite him to come up and and do that. And um, then we have a a song that he's selected and that I've, not for him to sing, (laughs) but for us to listen to. And uh, we're going to do that as we prepare for baptism today. And uh, while we're doing that, we are going to move a couple things around after he has shared. And uh, I'm going to invite you to come up nice and close and and witness things. We're going to move the camera around here so we can record this for him, for his family, and send that up to them. um, But we're just going to have a a blessed time because this is what it's all about. It's not all about Raphael, but it's about what Jesus has done in Raphael's life. And so, Raph, come come and share with us a little bit about what God's done in your life. Firstly, I would like to thank you for gathering here today to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. I am very grateful for the sacrifices he has made for all, for me. Uh, Just like Isaac, the son of Abraham, I no longer see God as the God of my father, uh, of my parents, but as my own. He is my God, uh, and Jesus is my Savior. I have had on my mind the idea of getting baptized and confirming what I feel in my heart. And that is that Jesus Christ died for my inequities. I am a sinner and I need a savior. He is my savior. Now, you might be wondering why it took a while to come to terms with the truth. Well, because sadly in our world, despite having so many churches, finding one that bears the fruits of our Lord, a church with values that acts according to the values is not easy to find. It is hard to find a church that is centered in Christ. Uh, On Christ, I mean. Um, it didn't sit well with me to just go to the first church I found, uh, become a part of it, and get baptized. I needed to get to know it first. Like marriage, in other words, to form part of the bride, the church congregation, I needed to know what the bride was about. So that is what I have done. I have sat in the pews of different churches trying to find a Christ-centered one. And I believe I have found the church, a bride, if you will, Uh, that I would like to be a part of, and it is this one. Uh, I am grateful that God has put me in a place that does share the gospel, that does put God first. I I wasn't looking for a perfect church. I am not looking for a perfect church. 
but a church willing to grow in Christ. So I think here is the place in which I will make this step uh, and seal the promise that I made to God, that he is not a God in a sea of gods, but he is the one true and only God, my Lord and Savior. Which brings me to my second point. I am making this step today. So if you were thinking the church was getting a jacuzzi for recreational purposes, well, I am sorry to disappoint you. Maybe next time, keep praying about it. Um, anyhow, um, I would like to thank you for accepting me into this community. Um, uh, you all have been very kind, and I appreciate that a lot. So without further ado, I'm ready to get baptized. Well, not quite. I need to change, but you know what I mean. But thank you. Amen. Take just a moment, young man. Let's just, while he goes and prepares, and while we make a couple of preparations here, let's pray for him, and um, let's just, you know, dedicate this young life. He's young, I can say that, I'm old. <laughs> and uh, just pray for him as he takes this important step of obedience, and uh, just bless him together as a church. Father, we thank you so much for Raphael. We thank you for making yourself known to him, and for him understanding how much you love him, so much so that you gave your son so that through his faith in Christ, he can have eternal life. Through what Jesus has done, Raphael's forgiven. His sin is gone, and you've come and filled his, his life and his heart. God, I pray that as he takes a step of faith and obedience today, that this would be a, a pivotal point in his faith journey, to say, this is the day I fully committed myself to the Lord. May we as a, as a church family encourage and, and disciple and Help to make him a more understanding, more, more effective follower of Jesus in this community and wherever you lead him in this life. God, we pray for his education. We pray for his desire to minister in ways to people to help them. Lord, may you do so through him. And may he be a blessing to those he works with, those he helps, those he helps to heal. I pray that, God, you would give him direct understanding and vision as to where you are leading him and that he will know wherever he goes, you are with him every step of the way. Bless this time and this moment, this sacred time, as he says, yes, I believe. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. And everyone said, Amen. 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 So you need to do some changing? Yes, I do. All right, we'll let you do that here. There's not too much ice left up here now. <laughs> The first time I jumped in a pool of ice. <laughs> <coughs> oh, good song. I don't know if you could hear, but Raph was singing along with all of that. And uh, this young guy's got a great voice and he's got a great heart, so uh, we're, we're blessed. And um, it's always a privilege to come to a, a, a day like this and a place like this on an occasion like this on Easter Sunday and uh, see a person of any age say, I want to dedicate my life to Christ. Mm -hmm and fully commit my heart to him by going through the waters of baptism. Now, this is just water. This is just a horse trough. There's nothing magical or special about this water. This doesn't do anything. It's the act of a heart that is fully committed to Jesus. says, I want to follow Christ. Baptism is a picture. It's a picture of a, an internal condition of us, saying, you know, I want to bury my old self. This is why we baptize by immersion, so that the old self is gone, dead and buried. And then just like Christ, we rise up to new life, rise up to hope, rise up to promise, rise up to purpose from now and for eternity. And that's what Raph is doing here today. Terry and I were able to hear his testimony last Sunday, and, and we can confer to all of you that uh, Raph has got a wonderful testimony of coming to faith and a desire to follow Jesus all of his days. I'll vouch for him, and uh, I'm sure we all will too. But um, one, one thing I haven't been able to do since we, we got back from Israel, I, I thought this might just be something just a little special. When we were there, um, we were able to see a, a wonderful area of the Jordan River where, where Jesus was baptized, and where uh, other people got baptized, and we got to be baptized in there. 
And one of the things that was given to us was a little bit of water from the Jordan River. And so I thought, let's add some. And just say, yeah, it's nothing magical, but it's just kind of cool. <laughs> and so um, there's a little bit of Jordan River water to add to your baptism tank today. Raph, why don't you step on in? I, I think it should be about 70, 80 degrees or so. It's it, perfect. Yes. It, it's perfect. <laughs> we had the heater going on like But uh, come on in. We'll, we'll get you just to, to sit right down in there, right in the middle here. You might want to remove your glasses. Yeah, that might be a great idea. I'll take those for you. This is one of the big things I, I like doing as a pastor, but... Honestly, anyone could do this. Any believer could bring someone and say, you know what, you believe, you can be baptized. But Raph asked that I would do this for him, and so uh, I am honored to do so. And so, Raphael, I'm going to ask you a simple, a simple question. Raphael? <laughs> just want to make sure you're still there, because you got really still. <laughs> do you believe in Jesus Christ as God's Son, as your Lord and Savior? Do you believe that he came that he died on the cross, that he was buried, and that he rose again, and he's returning again, and he is the way, the truth, and the life, and he is your Savior. Do you believe that? Yes. He does, on your confession of faith. Raphael, it is my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Grab a hand, and we're going to dunk you down. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Deb, could I ask you to pray for Raph? For sure. Because I won't make it. No. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for what we got to witness here today, and thank you for Raph's testimony that uh, he, he follows you as his own Lord, not necessarily the God of his fathers, but Lord, um, thank you for being his father. Mm -hmm. Thank you for showing him who you really are. And I pray, Lord, as um, Jesus was led by your spirit into the wilderness, Lord, that you would cover Raph for the next few weeks. Send a special measure of your Holy Spirit to yes, him God. to cover him in your grace and your love and just help him be super excited to follow you in this new way for the rest of his life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And everyone said, Amen. 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 We'll, look, we'll get, let you get dry. I'm